lot to talk about tonight, starting with the trial of three men charged in the killing of Ahmad Arbery. CNN's Martin Savage joins us now from Brunswick, Georgia. Martin? Anderson, the prosecution had rested on Tuesday. That was after eight days and 23 witnesses. The defense rested after just two days and seven witnesses, the primary one being, of course, the man who killed Ahmad Arbery, Travis McMichael. Drew down on him. Travis McMichael taking the stand at his own defense for a second day in the trial for the killing of Ahmad Arbery. Lead prosecutor Linda Donikowski continued to go after him during cross-examination. You also could have stepped around the back of the truck and followed him in the path that way. Is that right? Yes, but then he would have had an open, unrestricted run around the truck and into my open door into my pickup truck and go so, to the truck. So you're telling this jury that a man who has spent five minutes running away from you, you're now thinking is somehow going to want to continue to engage with you, someone with a shotgun, and your father, a man who's just said, stop or I'll blow your f***ing head off by trying to get in their truck? That's what it shows, yes ma'am. The prosecutor attempted to punch holes in his testimony. Detective Nohilly specifically asked you, do you remember if he grabbed the shotgun at all? And your response was, I want to say he did, but honestly, I cannot remember. I mean, we were, me and him were face to face the entire time. Do you remember saying that? Yes, and I was trying to think of that exact moment. Um, trying to give him, as, like I said, trying to give him as much detail as possible under the stress and of all this going on. Um, it was obvious that he had the gun from what I was saying in here, rereading it, that he had the weapon the way that I was describing it. Um, but why I said he did not have the gun at that second, I don't know why. Also pressuring him on his self-defense claim. And you were right there and you just pulled that trigger immediately. No, I was struck and he was, we were face to face and being struck and that's when I, when I shot. He started striking, he was on me, he had a shirt or you know something to that point and I had the gun and I was too close to drawing him. He's striking you, you've got the gun up in this thing and you can't draw down on him and it's just, it's a struggle and he's on you and you're going back and forth in front of the truck, is that what you're saying? Yes. And the prosecutor calling out his and his father's alleged intent to make a citizen's arrest. During your statement to the police, did you say that you and your father were trying to arrest Mr. Arbery, did you? Uh, no, ma'am. Meanwhile, outside the courtroom, pastors Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Jamal Bryant, Martin Luther King III, and attorneys Ben Crump and Lee Merritt joined the Arbery family for a prayer vigil, an event organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton. Joining a march afterwards to honor Arbery. Earlier, Kevin Goff, attorney for William Roddy Bryan Jr., for a third time filed a motion to keep Reverends Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson out of the courtroom. Judge Walmsley once again denied the motion, and later on, Goff called for a mistrial after objecting to this question from the state. Do you believe that someone stealing is deserving of death penalty, uh, Mr. Coffey? Your relevance, Your Honor. Right. The mistrial request was denied, but Judge Walmsley admonished the prosecutor and instructed the jury to disregard the question. By the end of the day, the defense rested their case. With that understanding, we rest. Ahmad Arbery's mother sounded hopeful after court ended for the day. I want to remind you it was 74 days that we went without an arrest. Things happen, and now we're here. And I'm very confident that we, that we will get a guilty verdict. Very confident. Martin, what's next in the case? Well, tomorrow they'll go over the charging documents. It sounds like it's just basic boring stuff, but it's not. That's critical because those are the instructions. That's what the jury is going to be told on the charges. Then the jury comes back Monday, 9 a.m., expecting to hear closing arguments. But again, it's not your typical case. Three defendants, that means each gets an hour. Three hours for the defense and three hours for the prosecution. We expect that the jury will get the case on Monday. Anderson. All right, Martin Savage, appreciate it. Thank you. Joining us now is Bishop Reginald Jackson, presiding prelate of the 6th Episcopal District of the AME Church, which covers more than 500 churches in Georgia. He was one of many clergy members outside the courthouse today. Bishop Jackson, thanks for being with us. What can you tell us about the prayer vigil that you attended outside the courthouse today? Why was it important for you to be there? 
And as I'm first, let me say good evening. Second, the prayer vigil today was an awesome experience. It was important for us to be there because the black church in particular, the black pastor has always historically been the conscience of the nation. And black pastors, we stood with uh, Eric Gardner's family in New York. We stood with Tamir Rice's family in Cleveland. We stood with Trayvon Martin's family in Florida. We stood with George Floyd and we're standing here now with the Arbery family. We encourage, we uh, do all that we can to love and help them know that they're not by themselves. That's what this was about today. You've said that you believe the, the defense's criticism of black pastors being in the courtroom was a legal tactic on, on their part. Why do you believe that and what do you think they were hoping to achieve with it? Well, first of all, because the uh, statement made no sense. Uh, one day he criticized the Reverend Sharpton for being there. The next day he apologized for those who he allegedly offended. The next day he's back attacking Jesse Jackson for being there. So there was just no consistency. In addition to that, uh, we believe there is an attempt on their part to get a mistrial and hoping that uh, black pastors, I guess, would roam into the courtroom uh, and intimidate the jury and that kind of thing. So we really think this was a legal tactic that we had no intention of walking into. Benjamin Crump, who, as you know, is the attorney for uh, Maude Arbery's father, said to CNN that a victim like Mr. Arbery is looked at like a criminal or a thug. Those were his words. And, and someone like Kyle Rittenhouse, who's white and on trial for first degree intentional homicide in Wisconsin, attracts support and benefit of the doubt. I'm wondering if you agree with that and... If so, how does that disparity ever get fixed in this country? Well, I do agree with uh, what he said. And the fact of the matter is, this has been an ongoing process. Uh, try to correct that uh, perception. And yet, I'm not sure when it's going to end. And I think perhaps that's not uh, something that's coincidental, but perhaps something that is intentional. Uh, I do think it's interesting that... Uh, Whenever it seems like there is a black involved uh, who is a victim, there is an attempt to go into their past, to go into their background to find something that makes them look not uh, as if they're victim, but as in fact they are the perpetrator. This was done with Ahmaud Arbery. It's been done with uh, black after black after black. So there is this double standard, but yet we are determined to support and encourage these families. Are you concerned about the jury makeup in, in this case? Oh, it's impossible not to be concerned about the jury makeup. When you look at the Glenn County, 27% of the population at least is black, yet there's only one black on the jury. That raises some troubling concerns. Even the judge himself raised the issue in terms of uh, racism playing a part. So I don't think that can be denied but yet we're going to be hopeful that uh, this jury will pay attention to the facts and let the facts guide them in making their determination. Bishop Jackson, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us now is CNN legal analyst Paul Callen, criminal defense uh, attorney and former prosecutor as well. So um, first of all, the makeup of the jury, I mean, the defense was able to get a, a number of potential black jurors uh, stricken from, uh, from consideration. Well, you know, everybody was shocked by this, and, and they should be, because we like juries to be representative of the community. And frankly, if you have almost 30% African Americans uh, in the community, you'd like to see them fairly represented. Instead, you only have one African American on this jury. The judge, though, said that he had questioned the defense attorneys who exercised the challenges knocking the black individuals off about the reasons for those challenges, and that when he questioned the attorneys, they expressed legitimate reasons for uh, asking them to be excused, such as they knew too much about the case or they had formed an opinion about the case or they had an association with somebody who might be a witness uh, to the case, that sort of thing.